Off day, everybody. My name is Julius Caesar Santos. Welcome to the pilot episode of Speak Freely. This is a platform for long form, free range conversation. All views and perspectives are welcome so long as everybody respects the reciprocity of the conversation, if you will. Your ideas are welcome, your criticisms are welcome, just as equally. And so long as we have sincere, productive, meaningful conversations about the issues at hand. And the issues can range from sports to arts to academics to politics to family to religion. Yes, religion, right? I'm down to discuss it if you are. All right, so tonight's topic, <clears throat> it's one that's come up in my life rather personally. I'm trying to start a company with some friends, and we are trying to get into the sterilization business uh, due, due, due to the global pandemic. It's changed the landscape across all industries, right, at all levels. So it doesn't matter what business you're in, you've had to adjust. I guess I'd say with the exception of online businesses, there are some adjustments there that's like delivery service and whatnot, but you get the gist. With that said, um, we've gone out and we've met with potential clients for a service. And very interestingly, the most recent one uh, that we went to was Caves. Big shout out to K and Day at Caves. They got a great little place there and uh, we pitched their service to them. And K to her credit, was extremely forthright, forthcoming. And she understood what we were doing. She understood the sterilization process and, and the benefits thereof. However, she didn't see the value in what we were doing because, and this is what she said, and it struck me, right? She said, it, regardless of everything that she and her husband, as owners of the bar, try to do to meet the requirements um, that are set in place, by the government of Guam, they still get cited, um, which their most recent citation cost them $1,000, and then they get threatened to be shut down. Now, with that said, I'm not trying to vilify the government of Guam. I'm specifically identifying a challenge, real life situation, where a business <clears throat> is facing challenges in trying to remain operational. So when you go to a restaurant, if you haven't already, this is what happens. You walk in with your mask. You are either seated or you can find your own seat. Once you are seated, you can remove your mask. The only time you have to put your mask back on is if you have to use the restroom, when you're going to pay, if you have to go up to the cash register, or when you're leaving. And so it raises the question, right? What is the point of putting the mask on? Uh, respect for people's fears, fair enough, consideration. Um, if it helps, fine. I mean, if we all recall the CDC, uh, mixed messages coming out at the very beginning of this whole thing where it says masks aren't really going to help, and then the next thing you know, the messaging was, masks is going to save everybody's life, lives. And masks are going to save everyone's lives. I don't even know if I use proper grammar. Forget it. We're moving on. <laughs> <clears throat> The point is, what I started to notice, at least as an individual, um, there may be others out there of you who start to notice the same. It's like we're lying to ourselves, or at least there's a percentage of us who are lying to ourselves, saying we're going to be good. And, and some people might be saying we're going to be safe from COVID, but really, in any guideline that comes out from the government. So the preface is that they're trying to mitigate the risk of contracting it or, or, or yeah, contracting it, right? So it's not, none of the guidelines are saying that it's going to uh, keep you completely safe from COVID. Even if you stay home, right? If you have family that goes out and then they come back, right? Now, we'll get into that messaging a little bit later on. I was talking about, um, it seems as though there's a percentage of people who are lying to themselves, like, you know, if I follow the guidelines, I'm not going to get COVID. Then there's another percentage of people, myself included, who kind of play along out of respect to people who are afraid, but yet still venturing out to try and live their lives out, uh, normally like everyone else that goes out. Uh, and then there are, those, there are those who are absolutely terrified and um, this is what I call the 
<clears throat> unintended consequences of good intentions or good intentions and their unintended consequences. What am I talking about? I'm talking about people who are so afraid of the pandemic that they are somehow able to leverage the government to enforce their will over those of us who understand the risks, however, are confident enough in our health and in the fact that we are taking the necessary precautions, added with the fact that we have the God-given right to live out our lives and the government is not there to restrict. Actually, it states in the Constitution that the government will not restrict the pursuit of happiness, right? Shall not infringe upon. So, <sighs> So this is where it comes down to coming to a compromise. Those of us who are too afraid to, to want to open up the gates of life again, <clears throat> and those of us who understand and see the catastrophic damage that the lockdown has caused, and I'm not saying this with any malice, I'm not saying this pointing any fingers um, I'm stating this as an observation. There is catastrophic damage to the economy, to families, to communities, to businesses, to jobs, right? And all of those are um, um, connected, right? There's a reciprocity between all those levels. And when we start to allow fear to dictate the rules, that are enforced to govern our lives, things start to go awry. <laughs> and all of these thoughts, you know, came to a boil or came to a head um, as my friends and I ventured out and starting our sterilization company. And I, and I thank Kay and Dave over from Caves for for, for being very matter of fact and saying, I don't see the value in this service when we try to do everything that we can to meet the standards and yet we get cited on the first infringement or, you know, the, the first infraction. And so I guess one of the, one, one potential solution there is in, rather than citing a business $1,000 uh, on the first incident, if you will, perhaps you can give them a warning and educate them. You know, it's interesting because um, these individuals, safety inspectors, right? Like they were there to educate, inform, and assist, right? When they saw something wasn't right, they would work with the business owner. Now there's this um, reaction where they immediately um, fine. Now, fortunately, there's a process that one can go through. Um, I forget what the language is. Um, but you request for a consideration and say, hey, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize that we weren't in compliance or um, there's human error that's out of the control of the owner. You can remind your employees time and time again, and your employees might be doing their best to stick to the regulations and the requirements. However, in the throes of their job, uh, particularly at a place of employment where you're on your feet and you're moving quickly because you have to service multiple customers at one time, um, it's difficult to stay perfect all the time. And so should a safety inspector be there in that moment <clears throat> when there's an infringement, there seems to be an instinct to say, aha, I got you, rather than to say, oh my, look at the situation that this individual is in. I can see that they're trying to keep up with everything from the requirements to uh, ensuring that the customer service is an acceptable level and then assist them, right? Or, or talk to the manager and say, hey, maybe you can, can get some help for them because I can see that uh, because of the rush, it's causing them to slip up on some of the, uh, the regulations in order to maintain the safety guidelines for COVID. And, and then we can get even deeper in that. However, I, I want to be very careful not to point fingers at anyone. I don't like the word fault. Whose fault is it? Your fault. It's my fault. I like the word accountability because when we talk about accountability, it's ownership of one's error, uh, and there's forgiveness involved, and then there's meaningful, productive,
conversation involved in how to make the situation better, how to fix things if they can be fixed, and how to improve upon it as you move forward. The challenge with that is it takes courage, you know? Uh, I mean, take your relationship, whoever you are out there listening to this, if you're in a meaningful relationship, particular an intimate romantic relationship, even when you're right in, in an argument, right? Even when you feel that you're right, there's always something there's somewhere in the argument where you slipped and you became accountable for, for, for exacerbating the, the situation or making, putting a little bit of gas you know, in the flames of the situation. And so that's what I was telling my um, close friend recently, Hussein. I was telling her that you know, when, we, when we start to get into a serious discussion, we'll say, I start to slow down my thinking and I, the impulse is to, is to not even listen to the other person or your partner when they're, when they're explaining how they feel, whether it's in, in, in an aggressive tone or in a kind, soft tone. The impulse is to wait for your turn to speak rather than to listen earnestly and sincerely and honestly. I think that's another aspect of this podcast, this vlog, that I would like to employ and I would like to hold any guest uh, to, to the standard when they come on to speak freely. It makes the conversation really exciting when you have to control yourself. You know, you shouldn't be guided by your emotions. Uh, emotions are there as kind of like a metric on uh, the bearing, if you will. And you should always be guided, guided by reason and logic. Because when you're guided by reason and logic, it forces you to compromise. And when you compromise, that's when you know that you're truly paying attention to the situation at hand. So as my friends and I are trying to start out this small business, I mean, imagine the challenges that we're facing to get contracts so that we can start to make some money because you have to invest in yourself as an entrepreneur, as a small business, as at any level of business, right? You're investing in yourself. You're, you're betting on yourself. You're believing in your vision and your dream and your plan, your, your, your plan of execution, right? The phases that you want to go through. Um, in order to expand and grow bigger because as you do that as an entrepreneur you create opportunities you create jobs you create situations for other people indirectly to benefit from how you're benefiting in your venture as you manage it properly <laughs> right we have all of this vision and we're like we can't even get a contract because although we know we provide a superior service to most of the sanitation or disinfecting uh, services that are out there now people don't see the value because it doesn't matter what they do they still face the challenge right of subjective safety inspections again it's not to point the finger subjective means that each safety inspector has their own perspective on how they need to enforce but to um i can't think of the proper word i can't articulate what it is i think would be most effective and productive and most meaningful for the safety inspectors to uh, in, in, with respect to their standard operating procedures or protocols, what is the goal when they get to a location? It should not be to look for reasons to shut a business down. Because, again, the thought is, haha, I'm shutting down this rich person. Da, 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 da. It's like, no, you're shutting down a small business owner, right? I mean, it's a tough business, right? And then you have regulars, you have customers who are like, what? I can't go to my bar. And the employees are like, oh my gosh, that's like, my part-time job or like that's one of two jobs that, that I'm taking. It's like all of these things need to be taken into consideration. It's not just black and white and not every business owner is a conniving, you know, mustache twirling, uh, looking out for a quick buck kind of person. And that kind of perspective is guilty until proven innocent. And our justice system is the opposite of that. It's innocent until proven guilty because when somebody thinks you're guilty, you, it's like impossible to prove yourself innocent. So when an individual goes into a situation already thinking the worst and you're looking for something, you're going to find it. You're going to create it. And so these are the unintended consequences of the good, intent, good intentions of these policies and these memos. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I believe in the, the, the cliche or the adage that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I think when you say, well, I have good intentions, right? or whenever somebody says, well, you know, they had good intentions. It's always about a failure or something that wasn't completed. And I remember using that. It's, like, it's almost like a precursor to an excuse for not completing or failing later on. And there's nothing wrong with failing or not completing. But if you're saying you have good intentions at the get-go, it's like, mm -mm. you got to have a goal. 
And you have to have a plan on how to meet that goal. How are you going to execute that plan? And so I'm not judging people. I'm saying these are the mistakes that I had to go through in real life. I had to reinvent myself several times in life. You know, I failed and then I succeeded and then I failed and then I succeeded and then I failed. <laughs> right? And then I'm starting to come back up. And I'm surrounded by people who believe in themselves, who believe in me. And collectively, we, we've, we've developed this wonderful plan. And I'm going to talk more about that. And so we'll get back into it. We'll talk about the mask etiquette as posted by DPHSS. That's the Department of Public Health and Social Services. This is a guidance memoranda. This one in particular is 2021-07. Well, there's a part here where um, it says that the government requires customers and vendors to sign in a visitor log sheet. This one, it's like, okay, they're talking about tracking COVID. But you know, it's, it's like an infringement of privacy, so I don't really want to get into that. That one I kind of just go along with, right? I have nothing to hide. With that said, I'm irritated that I have to sign it because why do I have to tell the government where I'm going, right, and what I'm doing? It's like guys out there, it's like in a relationship, you already have to tell your chick, right? It's like, I right, tell her, why do I got to tell somebody else? It's like I feel like a kid again. All right. So, and every establishment is supposed to post at least one poster that promotes behaviors that prevent the spread of COVID. And it's like, that's fine, it's fair. Uh, you know, you're shoving it down our throats everywhere we go, right? Um, but again, it's like the individual is sovereign. And the government was not here to help us, save us, and to, to make our lives easier. The government was here to be an arbiter. When there's a difference in a contract or an agreement, um, you know, and then we'll get into it. All right, now when it comes to masks, an EDE, that it's a, uh, what is that called again? I always forget these things. Eating and drinking establishment, an EDE, must require, one, the wearing of face masks by all employees, vendors, and customers in the establishment and on the premises of the establishment. Two, customers to wear masks when not actively eating or drinking. Okay. Next section, an EDE, an eating and drinking establishment, should encourage, one, employees and vendors to avoid touching their masks once they're on their faces. Two, employees and vendors to wash their hands. Two, employees and vendors to wash their hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or use hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol after touching masks on their faces. Not feces, that's what I thought it said first. But boom. Now, Interesting uh, point of fact here. If you want to kill COVID with alcohol, it needs to be at least 70%. Anything less does not actually get COVID. Uh, physical distancing. An EDE must limit the number of customers in the establishment based on current authorized occupancy rate with no more than the number of persons per table per party as stated in the most recent DPHSS guidance memorandum or executive order on gathering requirements. <laughs> Currently, I believe it's 50% occupancy is now being allowed. So you're now allowed to make half the money you used to make. That's really what that says. And I know that people are like, oh, you're just being a jerk when you say that. No. If you feel I'm being a jerk when I say that, I'm sorry you feel that way. What I'm pointing out is that that is basically what that means to the establishment owner. When it was 25%, what that was saying was you have an opportunity to capture 25% of the revenue you were capturing before when you were combining jobs and operating at a certain level. Now you have an opportunity to try and capture 50% of the business you used to capture. The rules set in place also make it difficult and scary for people to go out. Okay, two, provide physical guides such as tape on floors or sidewalks and signage to ensure that individuals remain at least six feet apart. We all see this everywhere we go. Three, mark distances of six feet for customers waiting for ID check. Consider a hands-free ID check system. Four, maintain a six feet distance. A, if tables cannot be moved, consider putting signage on every other table or booth marked do not sit physical distance table or reserved for your safety. I don't care if you like it or not. Number five, remove bar stools at the bar or other locations where drinks are made and served unless the bar can maintain six feet between the bartender or bartenders and customers while ordering. 
Six, if it is a bar or tavern, establish a dedicated ordering area where customers can maintain a distance of six feet or implement practice where orders are accepted by servers while customers remain seated. Seven, prohibit customers from walking up to the bar counter and cashier after ordering except for takeout orders and cafeteria style dining, food served by employees at the counter, which must have appropriate physical barriers between food employees and customers. Eight, Require customers to remain seated at all times in their assigned chairs or remain in their standing area except for use of restrooms for booth indoor and outdoor service. Movement of customers between assigned tables, booths, or standing areas is strictly prohibited but not from the same party. Nine, required customers to wear face masks when speaking with employees. Ten, if the EDE is a hotel, the ballrooms are allowed to operate under the following conditions. Here we go. A. Notification requirements are stated in the most recent DPH's guidelines and around the dining services and in-person door dining. B and C, we're going to skip past that. 11, require ample distance and minutes. 6 feet and installation of physical barrier. I'll keep asking the top line of the edge. I'll keep asking the top line of the edge. I'll keep asking the top line of the edge. I'll keep asking the top line of the edge. I'll keep the top line of the edge. I'll keep asking the top line of the edge. I'll keep asking the top line of the a. Disposable microphone covers are used to completely cover the microphone between each use. The disposable microphone covers are properly disposed of in a waste receptacle that is within each reach by customers. C. The microphone be properly cleaned and disinfected between each use. D. The only one singer is allowed to sing at a time. E. That face masks are worn at all times while singing. And F. That no more than six people are permitted per party per private room. 13. Prohibit the use of dance floors. None of that around here. There'll be no loose foot in this town. Okay, if the EDE is a bar or tavern that have limited tables and chairs, more uh, rules that tell you how to hang out with your friends, uh, and EDE is encouraged to um, do what they tell you to do so that you can tell your customers how they can hang out with their friends. Um, an EDE is not authorized to permit any on-site operations involving reservations to celebrate public or private functions like anniversaries, birthdays, weddings, graduations. Those are terrible. At EDEs and other public venues where the total number of guests exceed 25 individuals. Oh, okay, so you can have them. Just not everyone that you would like to have there. Do you understand? Do you see where this is going? Like... We get it, right? I think that most of these are common sense um, guidelines. The interesting thing is, and I saw this for myself, um, I went out a couple of weeks ago. I don't really like to go out anymore. I will go ahead and say it. I'm too grown for the club scene already. I'm 42 years old. <laughs> I'm too grown for that. Like The debauchery is beyond me already. Uh, one thing I did notice, though, that was very peculiar was the aggressive and outright rude customer service, specifically with the guidelines. Don't stand here. You need to stand over there. Hey, take that bottle. You can't be standing over there. You got to sit. You need to sit down when you're drinking that. You can't stand next to the speaker and talk. You got to put your mask on. It's like, I get it, though, because like the establishments are doing their best to not get fined $1,000 if your mask is like down here below your nose because you've been working and moving and talking and people have been taking orders. And it started here, but you're like moving and maybe something has a bit mouth. And when they talk really loud, then it moves. And in that moment, is it fair to cite the bar $1,000 in that moment? Or would it be more productive? Would it create a more conducive relationship with respect to the private sector working with the public sector and trying to, you know, mitigate the spread of COVID. I mean, the sad thing is that COVID is a new flu and it's going to spread and it's never going to go away. It's like saying, can the flu go away? Can polio go away? Can chicken pox go away? It's like, it's never going to go away. I'm not saying we shouldn't care. That's why I'm trying to start a sterilization company. I will talk about that in the next podcast. I really wanted to talk about these Entrepreneurs, these small business owners, they are the vast majority of business owners on Guam. When I say small business owners, I think we on Guam understand it. It's like mom and pop stores, uh, the businesses that aren't uh, major um, corporations. But even at that, major corporations, some of them you know, are able to survive. Um, but I'm sure they're not making the same margins or maybe they're making more. Who knows? Now, good for them. It doesn't mean that they're the bad guys. Good for them because their employees, you know, were able to keep their jobs. And we should be happy 
that there are those who didn't lose their lifeblood, essentially, the lifeblood to the quality of their life. I think for those business owners who are malicious, insidious, or, or, or have malintent, they'll be exposed over time. And we can't assume people are guilty. We, we cannot say that we know the future and say, oh, they have money, they're, they're, you know, they're bad, or oh, they're trying to make money, they're just greedy and they're going to be bad. It's like, come on. Come on. <laughs> that's not really an argument. However, I'm kind of exhausted right now. Oh, so I think that's all I'll say on that for now. Again, big shout out to Kay and Dave from Caves. Uh, it's a great little establishment. When you have a chance, go in, check them out. Tell them Julia sent you. Until we see each other again, speak freely.